hiring is hard. You make a lot of bad hires and you finally find someone you like. So what do you do? You load them up with everything. Well, all of a sudden, your business become became a lot more risky. If that person quits, it can take you months to replace them and really set your business back. So you don't have to go overboard. You don't have to hire five customer service reps to hire to handle five emails a day. But make sure as you're hiring, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Welcome to Honest E-Commerce, where we are dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer. And I'm your host, Annette Grant. And we believe running an online business does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. If you are struggling to scaling your sales, Electric Eye is here to help. To apply to work with us, visit electriceye.io slash connect to learn more. And let's get on with the show. On this episode of Honest E-Commerce, we talk to Nathan Hirsch, the CEO of FreeUp.com, a marketplace that connects businesses with pre-vetted freelancers in e-commerce, digital marketing, and much more. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Honest E-Commerce. I'm sitting here next to the wonderful Annette Grant. And today, we are welcoming to the show Nathan Hirsch from FreeUp. Nathan is going to teach us about hiring and scaling with remote freelancers. So Nathan, how do you know so much about that? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. I mean, I started hiring at a very young age. I started a multi-million dollar Amazon business out of my college dorm room. And it's if one thing that they don't teach you in school, it's how to hire people and how to manage people. And I really got thrown into it. My business was booming. I was getting crushed. I was working 20 hours a day trying to get all this stuff done. And one day I realized I just had to start hiring. There, there was no other option. So I started hiring people. I had a lot of great experiences, a lot of poor experiences. I actually ended up opening up an office and, and shutting that down and going back to remote and, and eventually building my own marketplace based on my own good and bad experiences from the Upworks and the Fivers out there. So I've hired hundreds, if not thousands of freelancers. And that's a lot of what I do on a day-to-day basis, helping people make great hires. I can't tell you as a small business owner how much that's a pain point. Uh, We are constantly hiring uh, and firing. Uh, You know, I mean, that's something I learned. uh, It was in a book, and I have read too many now, so I finally forget what they're called. But um, it was essentially you got to fire faster than you're hiring. So you got to make sure that you can. You know, it's a business decision. Unfortunately, these are people you like, but it's it's your business's finances is directly tied to that person's performance. Yeah, I mean, a lot of business owners don't realize that hiring is the difference between success and failure. There can be really good business ideas, really good business owners that can't get to that next level or fail because they make bad hires and vice versa. There are some average so-so ideas that accelerate because they put the right people in place to help get to the next level. Nathan, who was your first freelance hire, remote freelance hire? Do you remember? <laughs> so my first hire, it's funny. I posted a job on Facebook because I was 20, I was 21. I didn't really know what I was doing. Posted a job. This guy in my business law class messages me and says, Hey, I'm looking for a job. I don't really know what you do, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes that I need to make some money. So I didn't really even interview him. I had a quick conversation. I really needed someone. Hired him right off the bat. And right before his first shift with me, I get a call from him saying, Oh, by the way, I don't have a car. Can you come pick me up? (laughs) So... I drive 10 minutes, I go pick him up, I bring him back. It's kind of a hassle, but he crushes it for me. He's doing all the nitty gritty work that I don't want to do. He's learning fast, he's excited, he's passionate. It was the first time that someone else was as passionate about the business as I was. And every day on the way home that I would drive him back to to his dorm, we would just talk business and talk about, hey, how can we improve? How can we get better? And his name was Connor, and he's actually my business partner today on both my Amazon business and FreeUp. So I got really lucky with my first hire and I proceeded to make a lot of bad hires right after that. Um, But I hit gold right from the beginning. I saw the I saw the the end of that story. I, I like, did not. I that's I didn't even mean to ask that question. I'm terrible to watch movies with. I'm like, this is about to happen, guys. <laughs> that's so awesome. So he's still your part your business partner to this day, your first re- freelancer. Exactly. That's, did he ever awesome. get a that's car? amazing. <laughs> yes, yeah, this is Connor have a car. <laughs> he did get a car. He used that money to buy a car and eventually I didn't have to drive him back and forth anymore. <laughs> oh, that's that's a great Well, that's story. amazing. So let's like let's dabble into uh, you know, 
what were you selling out of your dorm room? Yeah, so I started off with textbooks. I had made a little bit of money during summer jobs and I saved it up. And at the end of every semester, I would buy people's books back and I would compete against the school bookstore. I created a little referral program so people would tell their friends. And before I knew it, I had lines out the door of people trying to sell me their books to the point where I actually got a cease and desist letter from my college to knock it off because I was taking up too much of their business. So I kind of realized that books was a nice little moneymaker, but it wasn't my long-term future. I was going to graduate at some point. I also thought we'd all be on tablets by now, which hasn't really happened. Um, but I, I started to just experiment with Amazon, the, this website that no one knew anything about besides it was a big bookstore that was just getting into other things. This was back in 2008. There were no courses. There were no gurus out there. No one really knew what Amazon was. So I started experimenting with really cool stuff that, that I was familiar with. Sporting equipment, DVDs, computers, typical college guy stuff. And I just failed over and over and over. And the only thing I could get to sell were these books. And I was pretty frustrated. And one day, I came across this deal for this baby product. And I kind of jokingly listed it on Amazon. And right away, I, I got five sales. And I came up with this concept of dropshipping years before I knew it was even called dropshipping, where I could build relationships with retailers, manufacturers, distributors that would ship products for me because I didn't have any place to store them. And I would make the difference between what I sold it for and bought it from. And I hit the jackpot with these baby products. So all day when I was in the back of class, I was just listing baby products for eight hours a day. People thought I was crazy. And that was my first, that's how my Amazon business exploded. I, I was selling millions of dollars worth of baby products and toys. So you did not have an actual e-commerce site, that you, a domain name that you owned that you sold your product from. It was all through Amazon in the beginning. All through Amazon. Now, does that business still exist? So we actually shut it down January of last year. Um, we A lot of reasons. I mean, we were doubling every year for the first five plus years. And we stopped doubling. The courses, the gurus, they came out there. And Amazon became stricter. And we weren't really growing our brand. We were kind of just running in circles. Um, and we were making money, but we weren't passionate about it. We were never really passionate about selling baby products. We were passionate about growing the business and scaling it. And once that stopped, there wasn't that much passion rolling around. So with Free Up, when we launched that kind of a, on the side, that took off really quickly. I mean, we're, we're still growing rapidly. So it was kind of a different experience where on Amazon, you're kind of secluded. You're, you're dealing with your own team and your manufacturers. And you don't want to tell anyone what your products are. And with Free Up, I got to go on podcasts with you guys and uh, speak at conferences and grow our brand and have our own website that we drive traffic to. So once that started to take off, we wanted to focus all our energy on that. So we let go of the Amazon business. Yeah, you actually hit on a gem in there. And that is with Amazon and the Etsy's and the Ebay's. You know, It is a highly competitive marketplace. And they make the rules and they own that customer relationship. So if you're not building a brand... It can, like you said, it can it can stall out and even start to just go downhill rapidly. I have actually known people that have lost their cash cow products on Amazon because Amazon entered the market with a Amazon uh, Plus or whatever their Basics, their products are. Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, that's the new thing going around in the e-commerce world: is focus on your brand. Don't be relying on one source, and definitely don't be relying on Amazon long term. And I think for for free up you kind of changed into how can we serve our customer before you're kind of just selling them products and you kind of switched it sounds like you s switched your focus to serving your customer and now that's where you're you know you're seeing that um excitement you know you and your partner that's very very cool yeah it's a lot of fun for it's a lot different than just selling a product to an end consumer i mean we're dealing with businesses on on both the client side and the freelancer side and we get to help people achieve their dreams and their goals and scale and and on the flip side, provide for their families. And, and when I was in the Philippines, people were showing me their, their cars and their houses that they were able to buy from, from free up. So it's been a very rewarding experience and much different than the e-commerce um, atmosphere. Absolutely. So let's, let's get into it. Like, uh, what, what, when should I hire somebody? I'm a small business. We're selling a couple grand a month of baby products. But we have a brand, right? We're doing it right. Uh, when should I hire somebody? Yeah, so I like to hire people early. And what I try to do is I, I split it up into three levels. So you got basic level freelancers that 
are five to 10 bucks an hour when you think of outsourcing and they have years of experience, but they're really followers. They're there to follow your systems, your processes. And I like to hire these type of people once I find myself doing things that are below my hourly rate, so to speak. So if I'm starting a business, my hourly rate is pretty much nothing. You're not making any money. You have to do everything. But as you start making more and more money, your hourly rate goes up and up. And if you're worth $100 an hour and you're constantly doing five, ten, twenty dollars an hour tasks, you need to hire some followers to come in and take those processes and those systems off your plate so that you can focus on sales, expansion, marketing, all the big picture stuff. The flip side of it is the mid level and the expert level. So the mid level are more specialists, more project based, craft designers, writers, bookkeepers. And the experts are the consultants, the people who can execute high level game plans that can um, project manage all the all the high level stuff maybe outside of your core competency. So as a business owner, I try to focus on what am I good at and where am I spending my time that I'm not good at? Where are my weaknesses? And I want to turn those weaknesses into strengths to the best of my ability, whatever I can afford. So that's really how I look at it. It's very tough to say, oh, you need to hire at this point right now or you're going to mess up. It's more along the lines of when are you when do you get stuck doing the stuff that's below your pay grade? And when are you doing too much? Are you spreading yourself too thin outside of your core competence? Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, it makes complete sense to me. I have been a large proponent of, you know, systems and delegation. Uh, or and then, you know, I think that from day one we've had a VA here and now she's up to 40 hours a month. Had now have a copywriter, like the tasks that I shouldn't be doing, you know, I no one else can replace me on the podcast. You guys would miss my voice. But I think <laughs> I think that uh, there's a lot of stuff that I was doing when we first started the business in the marketing and the sales department that I've now since systematized and delegated and even terminated some of that stuff. That's another key point is sometimes you don't need to be doing stuff just at all. You can just stop doing it and your business will survive. And that's something that you got to think about some of these you got to focus on especially in marketing you got to focus on exactly what's actually going to move the needle for you and you can't do everything at once yeah i mean we all run out of hours in a week right you can work 50 60 70 there's always more stuff to do and and then there's also the personal preference of how do you want to run your business do you want to be hustling all the time do you want more of that lifestyle where you get more time with friends and family where are you in, in terms of your own financial stability. And a lot of those decisions come into when you're going to hire and who you're going to hire. So t- going going to the hiring, if we want to... Um, obviously, if you're hiring a freelancer, what what are some of the... I'm sure you have some some warnings for us. Like, what are, what are the tips like red flags when you're hiring? Either A, putting too much on their plate or, you know, when you're interviewing, making sure that you're finding the, the right person. What are some of your best practices? I'm sure you can kind of fire some of those off to us. Yeah. So my biggest thing is I set expectations up front and I overdo it. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask someone three times, Hey, are you sure you can work this time zone? Hey, are you sure that you have the background for this? Are you sure that you can handle this workload? Whatever it is. And, and I really try to lay out those expectations, not just of the work, but also what it's like to work with me. Because these freelancers, they work with a lot of different clients and you are unique as a business owner. And I'm sure people, some people will say, I'm pretty tough to work with. I mean, I talk fast, I move fast, I have high expectations. I, I, I definitely, if, you're, if you can't handle direct feedback, if you're a warm and fuzzy person or you can't move at my speed, I'm probably not the best person to work with. So I lay out those expectations and I give the person a chance to back out. Scare probably isn't the right word, but for, for lack of a better one, I almost scare them a little bit because I only want them to commit if they can 100% do it. And then from there, in that first one week, two week, three week, I hold them to those expectations. If they're showing up late for meetings, or if they are missing due dates, or or if they're not, if they're taking my direct criticism personally, those are the type of people I try to avoid based on my past experience. So I'll be quick to, to make moves. And that's a lot where that fire fast comes in. Once you've invested a lot of not just money, but time into someone, it becomes a much harder decision. But what I try to do is lay those expectations up front and figure out if someone is a good fit in that first week or two. Absolutely. Support for our podcast comes from our friends at Simpler 
a new way to staff 24-7 sales and customer service on your e-commerce store. It works with your existing email and chat platforms, so setup is quick and easy. Simpler's network of on-demand, US-based Simpler specialists are standing by to answer your customers' most common questions. Set it up for free today and then turn it on or off depending on your customer volume. You only pay $2.25 for every resolution. No hidden fees, contracts, or minimums. Close more sales with Simpler by staffing your email and live chat around the clock with Simpler specialists. Start your free seven-day trial at simpler.ai slash honest. That's S-I-M-P-L-R dot A-I slash honest. We just hired a copywriter last month before Christmas. It's January while we're recording this and it's not going to come out till March because I somehow found 14 people really fast that wanted to be on this thing. But anyways, I digress. Uh, we came to that freelancer with a two-page brief on exactly what we wanted for our blog articles. And we actually hired four people and we hired them all, asked them all, set deadlines. I mean, we followed a, such a stringent hiring process and set all those expectations up front. And one of them stood out and we're still working to, with them to this day. So I can just agree wholeheartedly. Like, You have to almost over educate and lay out like you might think it's something simple and you don't need to write it down and it can be overlooked and that's like what's going to separate that from being a good hire from a bad hire and that that that's that onus is on you as the hiring party not sharing all those details yeah, yeah. there's a lot of assumptions that that go on i mean cli- clients I, I see it all the time they, they leave out a huge chunk of what they need because they almost assume the freelancer will know and and to be fair from the freelancer side again repeating my point from before they work with a lot of different clients. That some what's good for one client is bad for another. What one client likes is another client's pet peeve. And, and if you don't establish that up front, it's going to be really hard to get on the same page right from the beginning. Yeah, I, I, uh, someone shared with me something the other day, and it was like it was a brief. They were trying to like a, someone was trying to hire another agency, and they said I was sick of wasting money, and that's why I came to you. And I, it, that that phrase stuck out to me. I was like, I, you know, when I waste money, I, I we. Go down rabbit hole sometimes where we're we're doing the wrong thing, but ninety nine percent of the time it's because I didn't do the work up front to really outline what that project should look like. Yeah, and there's times where and we encourage so we have the terms of use of our platform, um, but we also have best practices and and we don't enforce them, but they're there to really help the freelancers. and And one thing we'll do it is we'll say, hey, like go out of your way to get more information, ask questions, really define it. Don't. Don't start a project until you have all the information you need on exactly what the client wants because you don't want it to turn into a he said, she said down the line or, or X was assumed, whatever it is. I mean, even getting really specific, it's not due next Tuesday. It's due at next Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Things like that save you a lot of time and money from both sides. Absolutely. The time zone thing on due dates, oh, that's so crucial. <laughs> yes. All right. So... Now that we're getting into it, so we're we're now we're moving along. You know, we're a little further along in our business. When do you start delegating some of that more, you know, important stuff off your plate? You know, some of those things that you kind of owned as a as an owner, maybe that yet your expertise for the business. You know, this is more pivoting from like a lifestyle business now into almost a business. Like, do you have any advice there on like scaling up? Because I'm sure there are some things that you have delegated off your plate. In the last years, with growing free up, that you never thought that you wouldn't be in control of. Yeah, I, I like to focus on low risk, high reward situations, especially as a startup, someone who who's never gotten funding before, um, that's reinvesting the company's revenues and profits back into it. I like to try different things, and this is part of the fun of hiring. So I'll hire someone, for example, to run my Instagram or run my Twitter for a few months, and it costs a few hundred dollars every month, and nothing too crazy. And what's the worst case scenario? I lose six hundred, a thousand dollars. Yes, it, it sucks, but it's not the end of the world. I'm not going homeless. And what's the best case scenario? They crush it. They do a way better job than I can. Leads are coming in, and that's what happened with both agencies that I hired to run these platforms. So if you're constantly looking for low risk, high reward situations, whether it's hiring a lead generation team or someone for social media or Facebook ads, uh, what, things that are not working. You can pull back on and invest in other things and things that are are working. You can put more money, more time into. So that's really how I look at it. It's really tough. You you see the the gurus out there and the course owners saying you have to do this to succeed in your business. And every business is different. What works for one business doesn't work for another. So 
that there's really no substitute for that trial and error approach because you might come across something like LinkedIn that is just crushing it, that's doing way better than Facebook ads when another business, for whatever reason, has had a ton of success with Facebook ads. No, that that's great. And I think it's, I think we should tell our audience, we had a little chat before we even started the call that uh, Nathan, his whole entire business is based on freelancers to this day, correct? All of yeah, free app- so we're entirely remote. Um, we have no office. All of our day-to-day operations, our billing, our, our customer service, my virtual assistance, lead generation, is all outsourced to the Philippines. All the higher level stuff, our Facebook ads, our, our blog, our SEO is US freelancers. Um, both are available on the platform for other people to hire. And then we have agencies that we use for, for different social media and stuff like that. So we really practice what we preach. We only hire um, people within the free up platform and everyone's remote. So let's talk about the free up platform. And, uh, you know, I, I have to admit, I've never used FreeUp. I have used Upwork and Fiverr. So can you um, explain to me and our audience what makes FreeUp different from the other hiring platforms? Yeah. So I used the, all the other platforms and I had some good experiences, some bad ones. But what I really didn't like is how I would post a job, get 50 people to apply, interview them one by one, took forever. And if I found someone I liked, they ended up quitting on me. I was right back where I started interviewing all these people again. So. I came up with the idea of FreeUp where we get thousands of applicants every week, virtual assistants, freelancers, agencies from all over the world. We vet them for skill, attitude, communication, let the top 1% in, and then make them available to clients quickly whenever they need them. It's free to sign up. There's no monthly fee, no minimums, no obligation. It's in our best interest to get people freelancers they actually like that help them grow their business. On the back end, Customer service is incredibly important to me. We have 24-7 support. I'm pretty easy to contact, but I have assistants that cover my Skype, email, live chat all the time. So if you have even the smallest need, issue, question, whatever it is, they're there. And then lastly, we have a no turnover guarantee because we know how frustrating it is to have someone you like quit. Freelancers on our platform rarely quit. It is real life. It can happen. If it does, we cover replacement costs and get you a new person right away. So... That's really how we've differentiated ourselves, the pre-vetting, the speed, the customer service, and the protection. And are all of your freelancers... I know um, some of them are you know, US international with the other sites. Where are all of your freelancers on your platform? Where are they from? So we're about 40% US, 40% Philippines, and 20% scattered around the world. All right. So I have an e-commerce store and I'm selling these baby parts. You know what? what uh, baby, <laughs> Maybe not baby, baby parts. parts. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, oh, oh, wow. Okay. So. Baby toys. I don't know where I was going out with that with the baby parts. Anyways, I digress. We're not selling baby parts, but we're selling baby toys. Anyways, what are some common things that you see small e-commerce store owners uh, like outsourcing through your platform? Yeah. So on the basic level side, you've got the customer service, order fulfillment, um, maybe bookkeeping or, or data entry or sourcing work. On the mid-level side, you've got listing products, you've got graphic design, you've got building websites, listings. Um, and then on the top level, maybe you have marketing experts or Shopify experts or Amazon experts you can hire to, to order your store and optimize listings. PPC across all platforms, whether it's Google, Facebook, Amazon... Um, and just overall business experts that can come in and help identify different ways to improve. So it definitely depends on what level you're looking for, but we have over 100 skill sets on the platform to pick from. And when you see um, e-com businesses come to your to free up and start hiring, do you notice once they kind of get a taste for the freelancer and having someone help them that there's an uptick pretty quick of them wanting to hire more and outsource more? Is that a common yeah, I mean, theme? This isn't really a free up thing. It's more of a life thing. Right. Making bad hires turns you away and, and makes you never want to hire every, anyone and do it all yourself. And making good hires is addicting and it makes you want to do it more and it helps you take your business to the next level and, and have more fun. So we try to... I can't tell you how many clients they come to us and say, Hey, I've sworn off virtual assistants. I'm never going to hire. I'm never going to outsource. And then a week later, they, they say, Hey, this is awesome. Here are the next three things I need. So besides... Besides vetting the the correct uh, freelancer, what are are there any tools that you use in your business that um, you know our listeners might want to use when they're when they're outsourcing that you that you use on a daily basis? 
Yeah. So I really try to practice what I preach. And one of the things I preach is simplicity. I work with 40 plus freelancers, virtual assistants, and I keep it pretty simple. I use Skype and email for communication. I use Trello for projects. I use Jira for developers. And that's really it. And you can run a very effective business using those tools that are all free. And I have plenty of clients that are way more successful than I am that use a lot of other crazy stuff, Slack, Asana, and all those things. But you don't have to do it. And definitely, if you're only using a few people here and there, don't feel like you have to get every tracking tool out there. A lot of times, it is very unnecessary. Yeah, we actually just made the decision to kind of almost terminate a third of the apps that we were using. And you know, they're, maybe they're a little more efficient in one thing, but like having 19 logins just makes it not worthwhile. Um, but I think I do have a tip for you. Uh, I've found that with my outsourcing, ever since I discovered Loom, it made I could walk my freelancer through exactly what I wanted and talk about it and show them on the screen. And that has increased my success rate with hiring. Like it's unreal. Well, tell our listeners tell our listeners what Loom is. Chase, oh yeah, please. Loom is just a it's a free uh, Google Chrome plugin, and you click a button, and it's recording your screen. You can talk to your computer, uh, and then when you're done recording, it's instantly on their server, and you can share that link with your freelancer or your web team if you found a bug on your website. I mean, there's a million uses for it, uh, but yeah, it's probably my favorite you know plugin I found in, a, in a, quite a while. Yeah, I love it. My, my thing on videos. Because I'm a startup, I'm constantly trying to improve systems, improve processes. I almost try to not make videos unless I'm sure that that process is concrete, which almost none of my processes are concrete. We're always trying to improve them, make them better. So I tend to stick with documents. But like I said, I have lots of clients who do it differently that, that have a lot of success. Oh, I mean, you just hit on gold. You're, I don't think a process is ever complete. <laughs> it's, you're always, you can always improve it. You can always make it more efficient. And I find I find me having that conversation with my project manager and my uh, my business partner here. I was like, "You guys understand that we're always going to make changes to these things, right?" Yeah, I mean that's kind of a mentality that that I get people that work with me in. I, I say, "It's it, what the line that I say is this isn't the way it is because I said so because Nate said so. It's this is what we've come up with so far. Now let's work together to make everything better and come in every day trying to come up with ideas and improvements and feedback and." Some of the best ideas that have saved me the most money or cut the most costs have come from other people because I've created that kind of environment. I have one important question that I think our listeners would be interested in is how once the you know the, you hire the freelancer is the the payment is that happening through free up or is that happening just between the freelancer and the hire? Yeah, just like other marketplaces, the the payments are through us. So our billing period is. Wednesday to Tuesday. We charge you every Thursday. You can pause and unpause freelancers. You can set weekly limits. And you have a week to dispute anything before we pay the freelancer the next Thursday. The freelancers set their own rates. You can negotiate it. You can agree to fixed prices. Um, but it follows that billing period. Awesome. And I heard that you have an awesome deal that you want to share with our listeners. Yeah. So anyone that signs up, first of all, my calendar is right at the top of the website. If you ever want to book a call and talk about your business, mention this podcast, get a $50 credit. Um, applied to your account to try us out. Um, And yeah, we look forward to helping a lot of listeners out there with their hiring needs. Absolutely. And I think we're going to convince them to make a coupon code that we'll put in the show notes, uh, Honest Ecommerce 50. But yeah, Nathan, is there anything else that you'd want to share with our audience? You've been absolutely wonderful. Yeah, Where can our listeners find you? Yeah, check us out. The Online Hiring Mastermind on Facebook. You can add me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook as well. I'm I'm pretty easy to contact and, and active on social media. Um, I guess my my last piece of advice is just diversify your hiring. A lot of people fall into the trap where hiring is hard. You make a lot of bad hires and you finally find someone you like. So what do you do? You load them up with everything. Well, all of a sudden, your business became a lot more risky. If that person quits, it can take you months to replace them and really set your business back. So you don't have to go overboard. You don't have to hire five customer service reps to hire to handle five emails a day. But make sure as you're hiring, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. We can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing the truth. 
Links and more will be available in the show notes. If you found any actionable advice in this podcast that you'd like to apply to your business, please reach out at electriceye.io slash connect. Please make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice.